summarize photosynthesis, the major steps, like what are the kind of the meat and potatoes of each of the phases? We covered that on Tuesday. We became familiar with um, the basic mitochondria, or excuse me, the chloroplast structure, and now we're going to get into the more detailed approach of what happens in order for a plant or any other photosynthetic organism to uh, to make sugars, okay, and food right, for the for the organism. I mentioned in class on Tuesday about a, um, a sea slug that actually has the ability to photosynthesize. And there's a recent article about it out in the social media, so I posted a link in um, my teacher Facebook and my um, teacher Twitter account. So if y'all want to, there's a short little link in there about the sea slug and how it acquires uh, the chloroplast. And so it's an example of an animal that can actually carry out photosynthesis. So that way, check out that interesting. Um, if you remember, we said there are two primary steps to photosynthesis, which include what? Light reactions and the Calvin cycle or the light independent reaction. When I was talking about to use the word dark reactions, it used to be called that, but that implies that these would occur only when there's what? When only in darkness, which is not true. The Calvin cycle definitely occurs when light is a like independent or um, Calvin cycle. It's fine. And um, we also noted that the light dependent reactions is actually subdivided into two major steps, which is dependent upon these different photosystems, photosystem two and photosystem one. We also noted something about how they occur. What did we learn about the operation of these? Photosystem two happens before photosystem one. Why? Why? Because it's discovered first. Number two, or number one was discovered first. Number two has been discovered. So but there's the pieces together. Photosystem two actually, the steps uh, happen before the photosystem <laughs> one steps. Okay. And if, just to recap where we left off, we said in photosystem two. Um, that reaction center containing chlorophyll A is going to get excited from a light photon. And electrons that are trapped in the chlorophyll A will get excited okay, from a low level to a much greater level of potential energy in them. Okay? And what that allows for is that chlorophyll A molecule actually needs to replace the missing electrons. And you know now the electrons come from where? From water. Okay. So a new mo uh, molecule of water is available and it's going to be split. Okay. Water is split into two products called what? Hydrogen ion and oxygen. Okay. I also noted on Tuesday that I'm going to come back to the to that hydrogen ion in just a minute. So it's really important, but I don't want to diverge too much. I just want to look at what's what's kind of the big process here. But we're going to come back and talk about that hydrogen ion and, and why it's useful. We also identified that oxygen, what can happen with the two, two really fates for oxygen following here. One, it can be used in that organism's mitochondria. Or released in the atmosphere. Very good. That's about where we left off. I kind of showed the next image to illustrate uh, how the electrons change in energetics. Once we're receiving a uh, excitation from a light photon, we notice that the electrons do originate in a form of water, and they get carried throughout the uh, reaction center proteins, and they get to the core, and where light photons excite those electrons. Okay, and they they just receive energy, like we've been kind of talking about for the last week or so. Now, what we're going to see is, well, what do we do with those electrons now that they have so much energy in them? Well, we added energy, so we're probably going to do what? Release it and regulate it, okay, so that we can do what? Use it, okay? And so we've added energy to the electrons, and so we're going to regulate
regulate where those electrons go so we can regulate where the energy goes. In this image, um, I, ha I did not give to you in the handout, but I'm just trying to illustrate the low versus the high uh, potential energy. The electrons will then be shuttled over or transferred over through a series of reactions and end up in the next photosystem, which is called photosystem two. Okay? okay. Dang it. Photosystem yeah. one. It gets me every time also. So they go from photosystem two and then shuttled over to photosystem yeah. one. I okay. don't understand why they didn't just change it. After well, then the old literature. Yeah, so they're like the old That's stuff. That's what a new edition is for. <laughs> yeah. I see it every year. I but journal articles exactly prevail, you know, like they're 1750, you know, so. It's just, it keeps you on your toes, you know. So the, let me restate that so we're not completely confused. The electrons in photosystem two originate from water. Water's lysed, they're split, to release hydrogen ions. We'll come back to those, those are really important. Water is liberated as well. But right now we're following the electrons. They're going to be shuttled or transferred over to photosystem one, yeah. photosystem one and we're going to uh, use them there, okay? And so the same thing occurs here. The reaction center, the chlorophyll in uh, the photosystem one has also a chlorophyll. Uh, they'll get another light photon. They'll get what? They get light photon, they get energy, so the same kind of beginning. But the key thing is the electrons for photosystem one came from directly from photosystem two. Okay. Their electrons came from water, right? So we're just we're just still using the original water electrons. Okay, so story starts out the same where the electrons get a boost, if you will, in energy. They get re excited. And this time the energy is going to be the electrons is going to be shuttled to a coenzyme, which I may have mentioned when we studied chapter four, when we talked about enzymes, okay? The coenzyme that's going to uh, accept the electron is this molecule called NADP. And you can, you're okay to abbreviate it. The proper name is called nicotinamide adding dinucleotide phosphate. And you can go with NADP. Okay. It's a what? And an easier way to look at it is look how I describe this. This is the electrons are shuttled over to NADP. It's an electron shuttle. It's an electron carrier. It just picks up electrons. And also hydrogen ions. So add on there that it's picking up electrons. And once it picks up electrons, it's reduced. Remember it says, bless you. When something gains electrons, that molecule is reduced. So NADP is reduced to form something called NADPH. Okay, so it's picking up hydrogen ions and electrons. NADP is a coenzyme, and what it does is kind of analogous to like a taxi cab, okay? But what passengers can it pick up? Electrons, electrons and hydrogen ions. That's all it can do. It can pick up electrons, it can pick up hydrogen ions, and it shuttles them, so it picks them up, and then it can drop them off, okay? That's what an NADP is going to do. It's going to pick up electrons. It's going to pick up hydrogen ions from the thylakoid membranes and we'll see them transfer to where? Probably to the, where are we going to need this energy? In the stroma. Okay. So NADP is going to be re reduced to form NADPH, picking up the electrons that originated way back from water, but now it's just got a whole bunch more potential energy thanks to the light photons that hit it in photosystem two and then in photosystem one. Okay, so it's just they're energized. And NADP is capable of 
accepting them at this higher energy level. be transferred to photosystem one where we'll see something else produced. What is what is produced or byproduct here? NADPH. NADPH is the product of which reaction? Photosystem one. transfer them over eventually to photosystem one. Before that happens though, that water, when it gives up its electrons, it splits into hydrogen ions and oxygen. We're going to come back to hydrogen ions in just a moment. We need to understand what they do. But we now know oxygen can go where? Go out in the atmosphere or used in that organism. Those electrons from photosystem two get transferred over to photosystem one, which then couples them to form which molecule? NADPH. It's the same molecule in the reduced or the oxidized form. Okay, lower energy, more energy. In the NADP. In the NADP form, it is um, oxidized. In an NADPH form, it is reduced. So NADP has more or less energy compared to NAD, NADPH. NAD would have NADP would have less energy than NADPH. So they're the same molecule, except for NAD.
Zion, what? Between the lumen of the thylakoid and the stoma. There will be a, a what? What word would we have used about a week ago or longer? If there's more of something in one spot than another? Concentration. Concentration. Gradient. Gradient. Photosystem 2, it does produce hydrogen ions and it contributes to a hydrogen ion gradient. Photosystem 2, those hydrogen ions are produced, being released so much that there's a gradient between the thylakoid lumen or the thylakoid space and the what? in the stroma. So these hydrogen ions that are released from water during photosystem 2, they accumulate in the thylakoid space or the lumen of the thylakoid. And as mentioned, it does create a gradient, a hydrogen ion gradient. We know now that if there's a gradient, we can do what with it? We can transport, we can use it, okay? So just splitting water, yeah, it produces, releases oxygen, that's what we tend to hone in on. But here for the cell, we need to focus on that hydrogen ion gradient because we're gonna use it, okay? The structure that uses the hydrogen ion gradient is called ATP synthase. Structure that utilizes the hydrogen ion gradient is called ATP synthase. And working backwards, we know this is what? ASD, equation back to the linear range. embedded in the thylakoid membrane called ATP synthase. Its job is to make ATP. The way it makes ATP is using what? Potential energy from the hydrogen ion gradient. ATP synthase is an enzyme embedded in the thylakoid membrane that utilizes the hydrogen ion gradient to make
make ATP. Or we could use a word that we used last week to phosphorylate ADP. If I phosphorylate ADP, I form ATP. This phosphorylates ADP. in your textbook I'm going to have for you in your handout kind of enlarged uh, that really does a nice job oversimplifying the relationship between the proteins or the photosystems 2 and 1 and ATP synthase. In this image, the thylakoid membrane, uh, it's colored yellow. It would have been neat if they'd have had the green chlorophyll molecules in there, but we can still kind of get the takeaway. You can see the relationship of the photosystems where photosystem 2 occurs before photosystem 1, uh, and you can also see ATP synthase. There's some arrows going everywhere. Part of the arrows are just the electrons that originated from which molecule? Water. Water, okay? And just kind of follow along on their journey. Each time they go to a particular protein, that protein receives energy. And okay, so we're just transferring energy to do different forms of work. So photosystem two, we see life is water, strips its electrons, and then trans it transfers them to the photosystem at four, the reaction center, gets excited, and they're transferred over eventually to photosystem one. Okay. Getting there, though, is something called the transport chain. Just a series of proteins. They don't have a reaction center in them. No new excitation. Can you see that? In the middle where it says electron transport chain. There's no photosystem reaction center in there, no green. Okay. What's happening in this electron transport chain? When those proteins receive the electrons, they receive the energy. What are those proteins doing? Look at the image. What's happening during this electron transport chain? Kind of in the directionality is opposite, but you're in the right direction. Actually, the hydrogen ions are moving against their gradient. Well, in, out, you need a reference to the gradient. And so it's moving, yes, it is moving hydrogen ions into the thylakoid lumen where there's a bunch of hydrogen ions, and so the hydrogen ions are being pumped against their gradient. We're concentrating even more hydrogen ions from the what? From the stroma into the lumen or the thylakoid space. And the reason it's active is because what we're saying is here. Electrons, which give energy, energy is being used to move uh, something in which way? Against its gradient. So down is against its gradient. No. You can turn your picture upside down, <laughs> and it's still going to be moving against its gradient. It doesn't matter how you draw it. It just means concentration from left to area to middle. It doesn't matter how you hold the picture. The cells don't know up or down, but they do know more or less. Okay. So what makes it active is that the hydrogen ions are moving from an area of fewer hydrogen ions to an area of more hydrogen ions. It could have just as well gone over here. It doesn't, it's 
printing a picture for you to hang around with. But you can use the gift tip gradient from an area of lesser to an area of more. And what this tells us is not only are hydrogen ions being released in the bonifoid space through the splitting of water, but even more hydrogen ions are getting into the space by using what? The gradient. more hydrogen ions? In the lumen or the thylakoid space. So there's more hydrogen ions there than there is where? In the stroma. So in the stroma, just right, lesser, fewer hydrogen ions. ATP synthase works is kind of complex, but I really want to spend some time here because we're going to see the exact same structure in the mitochondria. So we're going to see the same concept, hydrogen ion gradient, ATP synthase going on. Okay. And so if we look at look at the if you've got your hand out, you can look at ATP synthase. You notice how part of it is embedded in the membrane? Can you see that? And then how part of it out in the stroma looks like a big blob. That big blob is actually a rotor. Does that word conjure up some things for you? A rotor rotates. Okay. And so that's what it does. It rotates. But it doesn't do it spontaneously. It'll only rotate when what? Flows through it. Hydrogen ion. ATP synthase rotor rotates when hydrogen ions flow through it. question is, why does it rotate? Well, what does it look like the rotor does? It stays, it stays, it's pretty stationary. What is it doing? Look at this. It's making ATP. Okay. It's phosphorylating ADP. If you remember the structure of ATP, the source, those three phosphates are really reactive. It's going to take energy to push those negatively charged things together. And that's what the rotor does. It has little binding sites, so if you can envision behind the rotor part, and I've got a spot for ADP and a spot for uh, phosphate. When, I, when it rotates, what it does is it physically brings those things together, and it 
for forces them to bond together. And upon a full completion of the rotation, what's released out? ATP. And then it rotates back through and can pick up another ADP and phosphate rotate when hydrons are flowing through and then form another molecule up. And so it's only it's only going to rotate when hydrons are in greater concentration. And that video link, that virtual cell animation collection, will show a really nice video of this in action. If I have time, I'll show it. So if you've got your handout, look at that, that the summary image. Okay, if you don't have it, you can look up here. Photosystem 2 starts the light-dependent reaction theory. Okay? By binding to water and stripping it of what? Of what? Electrons. Okay. Which are shuttled into the reaction center of photosystem 2. Where what excites it? What's in light energy, light photon? Visible light spectra excites it. And once those electrons are excited, they can get transferred over to a set of proteins that contribute to what? What can these little electron transport proteins do? They can create a hydrogen ion gradient to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid space. So not only are hydrogen ions pumped, they are actually liberated with water being split or light. Okay. So we just split water to get hydrogen ions. We're actually pumping hydrogen ions in. That gradient can be used by another structure called ATP synthase. That as hydrogen ions flow through, it binds ADP and phosphate, forces them together to form ATP. So photosystem 2 directly releases hydrogen ions and directly releases hydrogen ions and electrons. It also creates a hydrogen ion gradient that can be used to produce what? ATP. That's all happening during photosystem two, okay? The electrons aren't done though after they've done their time in photosystem two. Where are they needed to? Photosystem one where they get excited with another round of light photons. This time the potential energy in them transfers them to a molecule called what? NADP, okay? To reduce it to form NADPH. ATP and NADPH are released in the stroma, so they're probably going to be what? They're going to be used to drive the power of the Calvin cycle, which happens to occur in the stroma. They're produced in the stroma because the cell is going to use them in the stroma before it flies. Everybody kind of see that? Any questions? Take a second and look over the light dependent reactions. And if you need to, why don't you actually just take two minutes, talk with the person bef beside you or in front or behind you, and just restate what I've been saying for the last 45 minutes about starting like two or three minutes sunrise photosystem two and photosystem one reactions. So I'll pause this for now. 
Uh, the light dependent reaction. I think it's been a while since I've watched this, but I think this might go into a little bit more technical detail. Maybe not. Um, if you look at this animation, you can see this is looking at a single thylakoid. It's not stacked up in a grana. We don't see the, the outer and the inner membrane of the chloroplast. We see just very simple right, reactions. Uh, in this, the green thing is representing what? Photosynthesis 2. The other green thing is representing system 1. This thing looks like a channel, ATP synthase. This thing is going to be part of our transporter, so the blue thing in the middle is going to be, what's its job? Electron transport. So its job is to transport not only electrons, but also hydrogen ions to concentrate them in the thylakoid space or the lumen. We see our, pre our inputs include water. At the end, our outputs will be ATP and NAD. You guys are starting to start to click, I think. So after today, before you go home for the day, if you got a break, write this down in an essay short term, something you might see on an essay. Just purge it out on your brain. Right? Just if I have time, actually, maybe I'll just make you do that before we leave. Okay? Do it. <laughs> it well, I spent 50 time. minutes talking about it. You can bet your hiding <laughs> is going to be on the test. It's important. So yes. So another word after the cost is the cathode. Yes. Same. Alternative. Thylakoid space is really specific. Lumen's really generic. And then you still have the cathode. Yes. But this is all trapped in which organelle? Chloroplast. So we know that light photons are used to excite electrons during photosystem two. We notice that they have to be replaced from electrons from water, which we said is uh, will split and liberate oxygen. And we can see some hydrogen ions in there in the lumen. Those electrons will then get shuttled over to, during the electron transport chain, that energy is used to pump hydrogen more hydrogen ions into the lumen or the thylakoid space, which is then used by a structure called what? ATP synthase. ATP synthase, which this doesn't show the intricacies of it, but once it moves ATP synthase, that'll give it energy to phosphorylate ADP to form ATP. And it sure does take about three hydrogen ions to complete the rotation. That just concluded the result of that and then oh, everything, the whole thing, photosystem two. Mm -hmm. The electrons, though, aren't done. They can get handed over to or transferred over to photosystem one, which is going to use that electron energy. It's going to get excited with a new light photon and then hand it off to help couple and form NADPH. These are the light dependent reactions. We have not seen any sugars made yet. All that photos, the light dependent reactions make for us really are what? What's, what's collectively the point of the light dependent reactions? NADPH. NADPH and ATP. Are you okay to move on to the light or the Calvin cycle? In summary, what the Calvin cycle is going to do, we noted it happens inside of the stroma. We already identified that. And what it's going to give for us, first, not before we get to what it's going to give, what's it going to use? Repeating? NADPH. NADPH and, and ATP, which came from photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. It's going to use this potential, this energy. What else is critical for photosynthesis? Now go back to your grade school. Any light, any water, carbon dioxide. So now here's where we see carbon dioxide 
utilized. That comes from where? From the atmosphere. How does it get into a plant leaf? The structure is called stomata. And it diffuses in. Basically, carbon dioxide is going to be joined with a, another carbon containing molecule that is going to take energy, the ATH and ATP, to do this. To make what? Glucose or other sugars or other carbohydrates. And so the Calvin cycle is going to use those energetic molecules produced during the light dependent reaction. That energy is going to be used to couple, or going to be used to couple to join carbon dioxide with another carbon containing molecule to make sugars. What's that other carbon containing molecule? Um, ribulose, bis, ribulose 5 bisphosphate. I'll give it to you in a, in a minute. If you just want to say five carbon dioxide plus a five carbon sugar. She was asking what the other molecule is that carbon dioxide is joined with. And it's a, it's a, a molecule that has five carbons. And we're going to add carbon dioxide. So we're going to make a, what, how many carbon molecules, carbon atoms? Six. Common sugar simplest. This is the, the summary, okay, not the details at all. It occurs in the stroma. It utilizes energy, energetic molecules from photo, the light-dependent reactions, NADPH and ATP. That energy is utilized to couple carbon dioxide with another five carbon molecule to make six carbon molecules like sugar, like glucose. to do this, the process that was the next question that was teaching is like, well, what is that called when you add the carbon dioxide to that other molecule? And the term is called carbon fixation. Carbon fixation, you are, I know this is a word, at least I use in chapter, right? Fix, you get a little fix, fix them too, right? You're fixing. Okay. So, fixing doesn't, right? You're fixing carbon dioxide with something else, right? That has another, right, other additional carbon molecules. But it's called fixing is because we gotta take that gas, it's kinda hard to trap a gas, right? We gotta capture that gas and fix it, bind it to something else to make a new molecule, okay? And what it is bound to is, as identified, another five carbon sugar. My abbreviation here is five dash C, five carbon sugar. Right? So it has a five, it already has five carbons on it. We're going to fix it. Okay. The question is, what is that thing? You could abbreviate the, the five carbon sugar is called RUBT, a ribulose bisphosphate is the proper name of that. So the RUBT is the five carbon sugar that will be carboxylated. That means it gets a carboxylated, it's going to get a carbon atom okay, to form a 5 plus 1, it's going to form a 6 carbon sugar. This is kind of difficult, it's a big process. So to read this, it says atmospheric carbon dioxide is fixed to a 5 carbon sugar whose name is called ribulose bisphosphate, or RUBT. Okay. You can just abbreviate RUBT. This is a chemical reaction. It's not going to spontaneously occur very well, so we should probably do, well, if I want to carry forward a reaction that would be spontaneous and occur very quickly, I could use a catalyst that we call these things enzymes. enzymes. This is very much enzymatically regulated. The enzymes that allows for carbon fixation to occur 
Does it have that common ASU suffix? It's all, um, it has an even more confusing name. It's called Rubisco. And you don't want to know the real name of it, which it does have the ASE suffix. It's ribulosis bisphosphate carboxylate and carboxylate. So the proper name of it does have the ASE suffix. Or you could just call it Rubisco. It's a what? An enzyme that does what? What does Rubisco do? It speeds up and drives forward carbon fixation. Okay. It binds to atmospheric carbon dioxide and joins it with RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. So if you were to look at a short okay. summary of, of where we're going is the five carbon sugar with the extra carbon dioxide forms a six carbon sugar. At this point, it's described as an intermediate. It's not just magic to a glucose yet. So this is going to have to take some processing. And so in the Calvin cycle, the first thing is is carbon fixation by utilizing this enzyme called Rubisco to form a six carbon sugar molecule. It's always referred to as an intermediate and I have not seen any actual nomenclature even in like the cell biology classes that I teach they call it an intermediate. So I don't know if it just doesn't have a name or if it's just too much for someone like me to handle. As soon as that six carbon molecule is formed, it is split into half. Okay, so if it has six carbons, it's split in half. Each of those byproducts will have how many carbon atoms? Three. So two separate three carbon containing atoms, or molecules, excuse me. Right now you can abbreviate it called PGA, or called phosphoglyceraldehyde. Uh, excuse me, the next it is converted into something called phosphoglyceraldehyde. So I'll show you the, the pathway better than you probably just a minute. Is it three carbon is converted into three? Yes. The metabolic pathway is right here in action. We studied in chapter four. a quick image of what Rubisco looks like. Uh, Rubisco is a really big, anatomically a large enzyme. I've got it in this tiny little portion on page five of your handout. And it has five binding sites. Uh, oh, excuse me. Hey, I said it's five. It has eight binding sites for carbon dioxide. So it, can't, it doesn't bind just one. It can bind up to eight and carry out eight carbon fixation reactions at a time. So it's really efficient. Rubisco. And you don't you don't need to know that. You can just Rubisco does carbon fixation. So this image is good to support that. This takes a lot of energy to do. And if we look at the Calvin cycle, the energy comes from NADPH and ATP. It's a really expensive process to carry out photosynthesis with a light dependent or in the independent reaction. So if you turn to page six of your handout, I just have the Calvin cycle just enlarged, taking up the entire page six. And so what I'd like to do is to just have you kind of freestyle on this and kind of take notes on it. Yes. Yes. It does the carbon fixation. 
It's the enzyme that does the work for adding that carbon to the five carbon ribulose that's being phosphate. So if you look at the over or the summary of the Calvin cycle, there are three major stages. And it's shown in a circular pattern, and not because these molecules are like on a merry-go-round, so they're not going round and round like the thing might imply. What it just means is what you start with, the molecule will be processed and be what is formed at the end, hence the term cycle. Okay? And so in this image, the cycle is initiated in the green area with the number one, where you can see atmospheric carbon dioxide combined to Rubisco, and what it does is add carbon to, and it kind of the little gray spheres represent carbon, so how many? One, two, three, four, five. Five carbon molecule will gain a carbon dioxide, so that the end product is having one, two, how many? Six carbon. And here's Carbon fixation. It's called carbon fixation. So the first thing is carbon dioxide will get fixed with ribulose to its phosphate to form this intermediate six carbon molecule. It's described as unstable, so it does what? Split into two. So you cut it in half, and each of those five lines would have how many carbon? This is where our energy inputs become utilized. We can then phosphorylate these reactions and also transfer in electrons. And so, if you look on the far right, and we have the blue, the second blue star, you notice ATP and NADPH, you know where they, these came from, are used in this first transformation for the production of this molecule called PGAL or phosphoglyceraldehyde. Phosphoglyceraldehyde has how many carbon? Three carbon. Is that the two that were split? They were split and then processed a little bit, but yes, it was started from that split. Look at the numbers here, though. We haven't talked about the total numbers, but look at this. If you look at this input of three carbon dioxide molecules and three ribulose to its phosphate, we end up with, it makes sense, six phosphoglyceraldehyde molecules, because they're split into two. Okay. Notice, if you continue the process of those six, how many are needed to keep powering through to make more ribulose to its phosphate? Five. We make, a plant will make six phosphoglyceraldehyde molecules. Five of them are used to just keep the cycle going. How many can actually be used to make nutrients for the plant? One. One. Okay. And so this is the big expensive part of photosynthesis. Okay. The phosphoglyceraldehyde, once it's produced, one molecule, one net molecule of phosphoglyceraldehyde can is described as exiting the pathway to be used to make nutrients like glu glucose, fructose, sucrose, carbohydrates, whatever, for energy, which is what we thought we were going for. The bulk of all of that expensiveness is used to do what? Just keep that cycle going. So the bulk of those phosphoglyceraldehyde molecules are then right, phosphorylated to form more ribulose is phosphate. Ribulose is phosphate. So all that energy to make these phosphoglyceraldehyde 
that can be used to make sugar, but the bulk of them, I mean, you need to just keep coupling and making mm -hmm. a peak out a little more to maintain the, to maintain the, just the process. And of that, one sixth of those three carbon containing molecules then can be coupled to form glucose, sucrose, fructose, whatever that plant is. This is collectively called what? Calvin cycle. It uses energy in the form of ATP and NADPH that was produced during the light dependent reaction to fix carbon to a five carbon molecule to produce sugars. It's really expensive though. Most of the byproducts are used to keep that process going. And minute amounts is actually used to make nutrient, net nutrients for that plant cell. Let me show this summary, this light dependent, excuse me, light independent reaction video. Remember, we're happening where? Where is this happening? In the stroma. Five carbon molecule gain or ribulose bisphosphate is carboxylated or carbon fixed. It's then split into two, three carbon molecules. They'll be processed using ATP from photosystem. One, two, two. And NADPH from photosystem one. They continue to process. And then once those three carbon molecules are, are available, they can be used to form things like glucose. However, we noted the bulk of the uh, um, phosphoglyceraldehyde is used to repower the rest of the cycle, producing more ribulose than phosphate. I'm gonna, we're obviously out of time, so I'll go ahead and conclude here.